Let's talk about securing a maxillary denture with small di diameter implants, a non-surgical case. This before and after, and this nice lady that had a denture she was unhappy with and she also had trouble keeping it in. Remember, what is it about dentures that people don't like? Well, a lot of times dentures are made with these cheap teeth that look like plastic teeth and they hate the way they look. The other thing that people don't like, obviously, is they're always afraid they're going to come out or move if they laugh, if they're talking, if they sneeze, and that can really affect the confidence of the patient. So I see a total transformation in patients following implant placement, and primarily we use small diameter implants to secure their denture. The lower denture is awful without implants 99% of the time. I personally will not fabricate a lower denture for a patient if they don't have some type of implant, either small diameter or root form. Why? I don't want to mess with it. I don't want to deal with it. I want them to like me. And if they've got a lower denture without implants to hold it in, you're going to spend so much try time trying to adjust that denture to make it fit, and you can't make it fit. I can't make it fit. Maybe somebody can make it fit, but it's not me. Whereas if I've placed small diameter implants, the only complaint the patients have, and it's a laughing complaint, you know, Dr. Cutbirth, I have a little bit of a hard time getting these out, and that is heaven to these patients because they come out of their shell. They've got confidence. They know they can laugh, eat, talk, sneeze, before and after. In a perfect world, you place six implants, max, uh, small land implants in the maxilla, and four in the mandible. I've placed as little as two in the maxilla if you just can't find the bone. Remember, remember the bone in the maxilla is much more porous. It's a lot softer than the bone in the mandible. There's lots of anatomy up here, you know, the nasal orifice, the sinuses, and sometimes you just can't find solid bone. So when they say you've got to have six in the maxilla, not necessarily. Two is better than nothing. And in the mandible, you know, sometimes you can't find four. Most of the time you can find bone for four implants, small diameter implants in the mandible. So this is a, per this is a good case where we found six, but what you run into is there's a sinus back here in the posterior. There's no harm in placing the tip of an implant up to about two millimeters into the sinus. The problem is if you've got a 10 millimeter implant and it's two millimeters into the sinus, you've only got eight millimeters of implant in bone. So the problem is not the implant being in the sinus. The problem is you don't have enough implant in the bone to secure the denture. I used to worry about implant tips, the tips of implants in the sinuses, until we had a few all on four seminars at my teaching center in Dallas. And these surgeons were going through the sinus and placing the implants to secure the all on four prosthesis to secure it in the zygomatic arch and the implant would go straight through the sinus. And so oral surgeons basically don't worry about an implant in the sinus at all. And according to the studies, the sinus membrane reforms around that implant. So it, it seems that it's not a problem with the imp tip of the implant being in the sinus. The problem is you don't have enough implant in bone between the floor of the sinus and the alveolar crest to secure the denture and stabilize the implant. So again, this is a non-surgical case. These are the mandibular, these are the maxillary and mandibular implant. This is the pre-op pantograph. Standard of care regarding radiographs for implants. As of last report, either a pantograph and a lateral ceph or a cone beam. Now, I do a lot with periapicals, and I'll show you uh, how I use those as we go through this case. But standard of care is before you start the case, you should have, at least in the United States, a pano and a lateral ceph or a cone beam radiograph. This is the pano and this is the lateral ceph. Before I place the implants, I'm wiping the ridge with chlorhexidine. You could pro probably wipe it with isopropyl alcohol, but you just, you want to clean it before you perforate 
the gingiva and the alveolar crest. Now I'm marking my spots, just, just a sharp tip magic marker. And then I'm going to view those, I'm going to view those magic marker dots with a large occlusal mirror. And I'm going to place my finger right here on the ridge and feel where the buccal plate is, where the buccal or facial aspect of the bone is. So when you use your pilot drill to perforate the alveolar crest, if you feel the buccal plate right here, you want to be sure that you're drilling the hole, the osteotomy, in the same direction as the bone. In other words, if this is the buccal plate, you don't want to drill in this direction or you'll drill through the buccal plate. Conversely, you don't want to drill through the palatal bone. So you put your finger right here as you're drilling, and this helps you keep the pilot drill in line with the slant of the buccal plate. And you can see how it kind of slants like this, but that's a fail-safe way to, to judge that because you're not going to drill through your finger. So see, this is in a perfect alignment with the buccal plate. This is a good drill motor. Now you can just use a slow speed handpiece for small diameter implants because all you're doing most of the time is just perforating the alveolar crest. This is high speed, about 1200 RPMs, lots of water and you want to move it up and down. But especially in the maxilla, you're only trying to perforate the cortical bone. Lots of water moving it up and down so water goes in to the osteotomy site. We get these implants from Park Dental. Now Park Dental only has 2.9 and 2.0 small diameter implants. Now this happens to be a 3M implant. You can't get these anymore and this is a 2.9. A 2.5 diameter implant is fine though. It works very, very well. I just always try to have as much surface area as I possibly can, so if a 2.9 would, would work, if there was enough horizontal bone to hold a 2.9 millimeter implant in diameter, then I would use a 2.9 just to have as much surface area as possible, but a 2.5 is fine. Now notice I'm screwing the implant in along the plane of the buckle plate. You don't want to screw it out this way, and you don't want to screw it through the palatal bone. So that's a perfect angle. And check it with this, check it with this large occlusal mirror. See, I've got plenty of bone over here on the palate. And put your fingers like this and feel the bone. Feel the bone. And I screw it in till I can't screw it in anymore with the finger wrench. With this wrench, I can't go any further. And at that point, you're going to switch to either a ratchet wrench are the winged wrench. Now, a lot of times you can't, you don't have enough room vertically to place the ratchet, the winged wrench. And so you have to go with the ratchet wrench. You don't want to go too fast because you don't want to burn the bone. You don't want to screw it in too fast. So go slowly and just quarter turns. 1001, 1002, 2003. This is the slowest part of the procedure, screwing in the implants. But don't go too fast, or according to the people that study these things, you could burn the bone. So in a, ideally, you'd like all the threads to be under the uh, bone. And you'd like this plate, or the shelf, to be just barely subgingival. You can see it right there, and I'm going to screw it just a little bit more. Now, I know that the implant has a high probability of success if I can't screw it in any further with this finger wrench. There's I can still advance it with the winged or the T wrench and the ratchet wrench, but when I go back and check it with this finger wrench, I can't advance it anymore. If I can, and it's to, put to depth, take it out and try another spot it's not going to integrate. See, so this is a good, you don't want to go into the incisive foramen. So be sure you stay lateral to the incisive foramen, which is just posterior to this uh, gingival landmark. I want to put one on each side of this gingival tissue about a millimeter from it. Okay, here comes number two. And again, I put my finger right here to mark the buccal plate. This implant does not need to be parallel to this one. There can be a 30% divergence 
of all these implants with small diameter implants. Now, if you're using root form implants, they've got to be pretty parallel. But because of the O-rings and the housings with small diameter implants, this one can be 30 degrees. The inclination of this one can be 30 degrees different than that one with no problem. So I'm checking it with a large occlusal mirror. I'm screwing it in as far as I can with the finger screw or the finger wrench. Then you'll get to a point you can't go any further. Then you'll come back with the winged wrench or the ratchet wrench. Then I'm gonna go in a quarter of a turn. And you wanna take this off periodically and look with your large occlusal mirror and be sure that the inclination of this new small diameter implant is about the same as the inclination of the other small diameter implants that have been placed. Don't just screw it all the way in or you may be off, the inclination may be off too much. About every 30 turns, I'll take a look and be sure that it's on the right line. Now it's very important if you're gonna change the line into which it's advancing, that you do it as soon as possible. Once it gets into the bone, it's much harder to change the direction the implant is traveling. Quarter turn until the head of this screw, of this driver, is just barely subgingival, and that will put the shelf of the implant at exactly the right place. And I can't screw it in any further with my finger wrench or my finger driver. So that's just perfect, about a millimeter from this papilla. See, and this is the direction we want to go. I want to perforate the cortical plate, or the, and the, that point the pilot drill will drop just a little bit. And here comes the Again, a 2.9, don't worry, 2.5 millimeter in diameter implant's fine. Screw it in with the finger wrench as far as you can, then come back with the ratchet wrench, and again, quarter turns. From here, apical are large threads. These are small threads. Now, these small threads can be either in the bone or in the soft tissue. And we've got a collared and a non-collared implant. The collared has got a longer neck on it between the threads and the ball. The non-collared, which is mainly used in the mandible because the gingival tissue is not th so thick, has less length between the threads and the ball. So typically you use a non-collared in the mandible and a collared small diameter implant, one with a longer neck, in the maxilla because that tissue, that soft tissue, is thicker. See, so that's almost perfect. I'm going to go just a hair more so that platform is just a tiny bit subgingival. And I'm checking it with the finger wrench that I can't screw it any further. It won't advance any further, so that's perfect. Now, I know I'm good with four. It gets a little tricky when you get to the fifth and the sixth one, and I'll show you how to handle that. So here we go again. So typically we use 2.4. 2.5 or 2.9 millimeter in diameter small diameter implants in the maxilla. We use 1.8 or 2.0 in the mandible most of the time. If you're placing implants into a ridge that has healed following tooth extraction. Now, on the other hand, if you're extracting the teeth and placing the implants at the same time, you may use a wider implant in the mandible. So finger driver, as far as you can go. Now, how far are these apart? About seven millimeters, because you want to be sure you've got room for the housing. So from the tip of this one to the tip of this one should be about seven millimeters, and that gives room for the housings to fit on the individual implants and have enough room to seat. Then I'm just checking the alignment with that large occlusal mirror to be sure that the direction of this implant is generally in the direction of these others. It doesn't have to be perfect. Remember, each implant can be off 30 degrees, and that's just fine. The housings with the O-rings give you that latitude. Checking it again. This looks good. I want the platform to be just slightly subgenital. Well, slightly. What does that mean? About half a millimeter. About a half a millimeter. Checking it with the finger wrench, I can't screw it in any further. Checking them all, can't screw any of them in. That looks good, that looks good. That's very good direction and placement. You can see here's the buckle plate. Now ideally, you want at least a millimeter of bone all the way around the implant. So you don't want to put this implant right here because there's not going to be a millimeter of bone. And when the patient moves their, their mandible 
into eccentric function, grinding their teeth. There's not enough bone to support it, so you'd like at least a millimeter of bone all the way around these implants. I'm seeing if I've got enough room to place a fifth and sixth implant. So as you can see, this is the left side, and I'm measuring from here to the sinus. I'd like to place that implant right there. And so this is just my measuring app on my computer. And so from here to here, let's say I'm actually measuring from here about 5.93, but I've got enough room right here to place an implant. I want to be just, that's six right there, so I want to be a little uh, mesial to that. And what you, what you actually do is just measure on the radiograph from this implant to where you want to get the implant to go into the bone and that's where you're going to drill your osteotomy site. And again, it doesn't matter if the tip of that implant is in the bone. That's of no consequence. The key is, do you have enough of the implant and the threads in the bone to secure the implant and make it stable with osseo integration? I can't screw it anymore with the finger wrench. Perfect, right there. The most stable implant is one in which the tip of the implant is in cortical bone. So that's what that white is right there. That is a total bullseye. Now we're gonna check the same thing on the other side. So you can see here's the floor of the sinus. So I'd like to place it right there where I've got the most bone from the floor of the sinus to the alveolar crest. So what I did was I measured from here, this implant to the ideal site on that periapical radiograph. That's how I use periapical radiographs because they're one to one when you're measuring if you have a good radiographic alignment. The other thing they're very good for is uh, if I'm drilling an osteotomy site with my pilot drill, I can go part way in and if I've got an anatomical landmark like a nerve, sinus, I can measure from the tip of the pilot drill to that anatomical point of anatomical concern and see how far I have from the, the tip of the pilot drill to the nerve, the sinus, whatever it is you're interested in knowing uh, the distance to. Screwing it in with the finger wrench first and with this little plastic tip, then the finger wrench checking the alignment before I get carried away with the fingered wrench then come back with the ratchet wrench. Now the only reason I'm using a ratchet wrench and not the winged or the T wrench is because I don't have enough vertical room to place the winged wrench in the patient's mouth. So coming back with the finger wrench and tightening, be sure I can't screw it in any further with that and bingo, right on the money in cortical bone, in cortical bone. So that really stabilizes that implant if the tip of the implant is in cortical bone. Now this implant is not in cortical bone. This would have been cortical bone, but that implant is long enough that's, that that's plenty stable. The maxillary bone is much softer than the mandibular bone. So you've got to have more surface area of implant in the bone to stabilize the implant in the maxilla than the mandible. That's why we can go with a 1.8 or a 2.0 millimeter diameter implant in the mandible because the bone is so hard, it doesn't take as much surface area to stabilize that implant. You've got to have more surface area in the maxilla. A 1.0, I mean 1.8 or a 2.0 implant in the maxilla really wouldn't work unless it was very long, like 15, 18 millimeters long. There we go, those look good. Plenty of buckle bone, good alignment. You can see everything's within uh, a 30% angulation of other implants. See, this one's a little bit more palatal than the others, that's just fine. This is her original denture. Now what we do is we place Blue Bite, which is polyvinyl siloxane, inside her denture and put it in the patient's mouth on top of the implants and it marks the places where the implants are located. Then I go to the lab and cut holes through those spots with a large round burr or you can use a large 33 carbide burr. So these are the holes straight through and I'm gonna enlarge them considerably in the mouth. I want plenty of room to see the implants. This, I place this in the patient's mouth and these implants, the balls of the implants, poke through those holes. Now these 
are shims, little green shims. And you use these as blockout shims when you're pulling a housing off of an implant with acrylic when you're seating the final denture. But they're wonderful for this. When you're relining a denture during healing, it's an interim denture while they're healing because, and you're soft lining that denture because if you place soft liner in the denture and you don't put these shims on the implants and the only thing that's touching the heads of the implants is the soft liner. It folds over and it's very difficult for the patient to place the denture on those implants. Whereas if you put these shims on the, on the implants, and then soft line it and pull those shims in the soft liner, it's very easy for the patient to place the provisional denture back in the mouth. Then what, what I'm doing is just feeling the top of the ball with these scissors and then cutting that green shim off right there. Then where you made the holes in the denture, you want to block it out with either pink wax or now what we're using a lot is a cellophane paper, uh, paper like you use in your kitchen. I mean a cellophane wrap, just put that cellophane across there and what that does, it keeps soft liner from pouring out all over the denture. You just warm that wax and put it over the palatal side and it blocks out those holes so the, the soft liner doesn't come pouring out onto the palatal surface in that denture. It's a lot harder to remove. Now the other thing you want to do is put a lot of Vaseline on the palatal of the denture, of the immediate denture, so that that soft liner doesn't stick to it. See, this is just softened wax, and now here's the Vaseline, thick coat of Vaseline all over this, because it's gonna come out these holes from the inside, and I'm relining the entire denture. This is just soft liner, any of it's okay. Push that to place slowly, and see we pulled these shims in the soft liner, and this is gonna make it very easy for the patient to locate the balls of those implants when they're seeding this immediate or transitional denture. So there are the implants in place, perfect. See, this is engaged in cortical bone, cortical bone, cortical bone, cortical bone. This one's not, and this one's not. But those are fine because they're probably 15 millimeters long. This is before and after, lower before and after upper. So in this video, we're not teaching you how to make, fabricate the denture. We're just showing you how to uh, place the maxillary implants and the provisional denture. But this is the final, and that's the Dental Minute. Hey y'all, I know that you love this episode of the Dental Minute. Have you subscribed yet? If you have not, you need to press subscribe right now and get fired up because next week we are talking about seeding mandibular veneers. It's going to be so informative. You're going to love it. We'll see you next week.